Well, good morning, everybody. So we are right almost in the, right just past the middle of our study. We're almost done with it, actually. So we've got uh, chapter three to finish up with. And so pretty excited. But what I'm excited about for today is that today is the heart of Titus. This is where we find a lot of what Paul is talking about uh, to Titus, the power of Titus, uh, the letter, where, where Paul is going to launch Titus into the stratosphere with what he is tasked to do. In order to do that, there's a couple things I want to do. One, I want to geek out for a second. Mark knows this about me. Some of you, mo mo some of you may know. I'm, I'm a, like a science nerd. I, I'm not... I never was any good at any science or anything, uh, but um, I like to, s to hear about some of the breakthroughs that's happening, and they've just done another little breakthrough. They finished up uh, what a research project on uh, how to get a spacecraft, and they're calling it a spacecraft, uh, from here to our nearest star system, which is Alpha Centauri, which is 20 light years away, right? And I'm like, how are they going to do that? And how do they figure this out? Well, here's the details. And it has something to do with our lesson. Um, they say it's a spaceship. It's not really a spaceship for anybody to be onto because it, it's, a, it's a chipboard about that big. And then it has a, 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 a sail on it. They call it a sail. And it's, I think it's like, like this big around. <coughs> and... What, they, what this is, it's a sail that they're going to launch a whole bunch of these, like hundreds of these little chip with these sails on. They're going to they're have a satellite in space, and they'll launch them out. And then from Earth or from space, they can't figure out where, where there's going to be a huge array of lasers. Yes, lasers. And they're going to shoot lasers at this sail. And the sail is going to be able to capture the energy, and the photon energy from, this, from the lasers is going to propel this device one-fifth the speed of light. <laughs> so it'll be able to get there uh, in 20 years. And we'll have our first close-up images of the star system, which we say often is Betelgeuse to Alpha Centauri. What? What they had to figure out how to do is how t how the, what this sail they're going to make out of that's going to capture the laser light. Once the lasers hit this, um, it's so powerful that they had to figure out how it had to how the sail is going to not just be destroyed once all these lasers hit this sail. So it's it's there's no engine on it, there's no there's no propulsion system on it, and the only propulsion system is light. They're going to shoot light at this this thing and it's going to go to Alpha Centauri. I find that fascinating and somewhat connected to our study today because um, we're going to find out that Paul is talking to Titus about he's going to be launched into an endeavor and the type of things he's going to have to do, he has no energy source for that. He has no propulsion system for himself. It's going to have to come from somewhere else. And we've been kind of playing with this idea a little bit as we've been going through Paul's words to Titus. But now it's, 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 to, the, it's to the meat of, well, to the bone of what we're talking about. But I want to do a little bit of a recap. And so let's touch some things here, what we talked about at the very beginning. So first thing we looked at was that Paul was writing to Titus and he had goals for Titus to... Um, to, to uh, accomplish. One of the goals was to do what? <laughs> Appoint leaders, right? The next thing was, was instructions on how the church was going to be able to live and work and, and move in two different worlds. We haven't really used those word, that vocabulary yet, but that's kind of what he's talking about. How can the church be a place where it is... Um, still in Crete with, with all of its problems that it has on the island and still be a shining beacon for truth and uh, for the gospel. So how to live in two different worlds. And then the third one um, is uh, how to live fully in grace. And so what this, what this letter curtails, it curtail, entails is these three goals. But summarized it this way. Titus, this is Paul's words. I'm, I'm paraphrasing Paul. Titus, I want you to go to Crete 
and set things right in the churches. That was the goal for the, 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 the goal. That was the first thing. Then we looked at this idea of, of what's going to um, give Titus that kind of strength. And so uh, he's, Paul is talking about some big theology and doctrinal words to talk about how big God is, how much this calling is, because he wants Titus to know that this job is not being asked of him by some earthly person named Paul, but by a cosmic God who is empowering him to go. So Paul, in, this, in, in part two, he's driving Titus to know the foundations of his calling. And we, learn our, we, we, look, we apply that to ourselves, that um, the kind of callings that God lays upon your heart for your ministry, it doesn't come from man. It doesn't come from any kind of instruction from men. We may be able to help you. I may be, one, one of the things I consider my calling is, is to help you flesh out and, and, and uh, 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 push your calling further. That's, that's one of my callings. But I know that that's not coming from me. That's, a, that's something that God has called me to do. And so this calling is not from Paul, but from God. And so that's what part two he is talking about. Titus needs to know that the calling is from God, not from Paul. And because of that, I'll re-say this again, when things get hard on Crete, and they're going to, and they will, just like it's hard with any ministry, um, it's, it is, we have to be able to, we have to rest in something in our calling more than just, I was asked by, Steve or, or, or Jason or by my Sunday school class to do this. It's something that we say, God called me to do this. And that's why I get my perseverance to continue on in this ministry. Then we talked about that hard uh, part, that, that part of leadership uh, and part of teaching these people also means uh, encouraging people and rebuking people, being able to say stop or no. Uh, and we'll see more of that today. And so we looked at why, why is Paul encouraging Titus to tell people no? Well, we looked at Crete itself. Crete is a pretty um, depraved island. And there are things that they're doing that, that, that they need ought not to do, especially when they say, I'm a Christian and I'm doing these things. So Paul tells Titus, you're going to have to uh, rebuke them boldly, encouraging them boldly. Why? so that they may, be, they may be sound in the faith. Um, so many times in my ministry, when I uh, approach somebody and, and I have to, there's an there's a, there's a arena of correction. I have two choices to make. One, I can correct the person and say, we, we're gonna have to stop what we're doing, take a break, and we're gonna have to do some, uh, uh, do some teaching, do some relearning here. Or, and I've done this too, where I'm gonna say, you know what, um, Let's just see how far we can go. Let's continue on going. And every time I, 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 I don't step into the world of rebuke and love, more pain comes along the way every single time. And so when we learn, and when Paul tells Titus, rebuking is so important, Encour as, as important as encouraging, because there are times when all of us need to be told to stop, right? And so we do that so that we may be sound of faith. And I have this picture here of a parent and a daughter. Uh, we, we rebuke our kids, don't we? We don't do it out of hatred. We don't do it out of, out of jealousy or any other kind of emotion, except we don't want them to continue down this path because we know what this path leads to, destruction. So we rebuke and we encourage so that they may be sound in the faith. So this is a huge, uh, huge lesson that we had. Then yesterday, or last week, we talked about more of a leadership aspect of it. So we talked about that when, when Paul tells Titus, set the church straight, this is kind of what he's talking about. There are leaders, and we kind of identified that, that if this diagram here was to be leaders, we kind of looked at these three people and said, hey, these, these are in positions of leadership. This one's pointing out, leading the way with the fire. This one's holding hands with the leaders, saying, hey, come on. And this one's encouraging all these others. But then we also looked at the followers. So not just leaders and the quality of leadership, but now we have the quality as a followership. Um, you guys have heard this phrase, one of the worst patients is to, uh, the worst kind of patient is a what? A man. 
Wow. Yes. <laughs> yes. No, no. No, no. I, I agree. I agree. I was going to go doctor, <laughs> but, you know, um, the worst kind of patient is a doctor because they are so aware of what they need to do. So here we have all these people here, and they've learned how to follow. And, and I'll even add this. A good leader knows how to follow. He's learned how to follow. Um, and so you have all these leaders here, and you have these followers. We gained some insight about what Titus was talking about about the qualities of a, of a leader and the qualities of a follower. And when they all line up in this natural way of how the church operates, then all of a sudden we have a church that's functioning healthy. So we have part four is, Titus set the church in a natural order of gifts and abilities so that, and last week I left off with a cliffhanger, and now we're going to get to the cliffhanger. So why, it, why all this? Why are we doing all of this? So that, <coughs> Paul says, I want you to declare these things. And that's what today is about, is declaring these things. So that the church will be a stage to proclaim God's grace. So all of these things that Paul, that Paul is asking Titus to do is pointed towards this one aspect right here. So that the church in Crete, the churches in Crete, the people in Crete will see the character, the nature, the love of God. So the church will become a stage for, to proclaim God's grace. Now, there are some really powerful and fascinating words we're going to go through. So here's what I want you to do. Turn your Bibles to uh, Titus chapter 2 and verse 11. And I'm going to read the, the verses up here. This is from the ESV. You go ahead and, and just uh, follow along in your, in your Bible. If there's any words, again, that, that are, that are uh, translated radically different, raise your hand and let's talk about what those, how those words are, are, are um, translated. And I can already guarantee you there's one really big one, and we'll, it's this one right here. Um, but let's go in here. So here's, your, here's your, your dive into Titus chapter 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of, our glory, of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. <laughs> Man, this is so much stuff. I, 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 as I was studying this, I thought, I'm not sure I'll be able to get through all of this. And this may be a two-parter lesson here for today, but we'll see what happens. Because there's, it's almost going to be verse by verse as we go through this because there's so much in each of, each of these things. So here's what I want to do. Let's keep with the theme of a stage. So if God's, if the church is to be the stage for God's grace to reveal and unfold and, and, and to get people to be attracted to God's grace, what does that look like? So let's keep on with that. So the first thing here, <laughs> grace is our hero. Look at the way Paul talks about this. For the grace of God has appeared. And when he says this, this is almost like that, that superhero moment in the movies where the superhero goes, boom, and dust flies everywhere, and he's like right there. So uh, this is, this is kind of what Paul is, is telling Titus. The grace of God is here. Um, it has appeared, and it brings salvation to all the people in a heroic way. It breaks through all of the garbage from Crete. And so basically, you can almost imagine Crete being the, being the landing place for this superhero, which is God's grace. Boom. Now, Crete, just because the grace of God is now on Crete, everything for Crete is about to change. Um, I try to think of some illustrations, and I was gonna, I'm going to ask you to maybe think with me for some illustrations what this is like. The idea here is that first and foremost, here Paul says the grace of God, so grace here is being as a, as a definition, so grace is being defined here. The grace of God has appeared, but also <coughs> grace is being described. So the idea here 
is to say um, when something gets when something is in it hmm, how, should I, how about this when I talk to teenagers I'll say this when you walk into your group of friends your presence should automatically change how your group of friends operate and act like that's what that's what's just so so yes there is a way that there is a, a thing where if you walk in and they're talking about gross things you being there should stop them talking about gross things just because you're there um i thought of like um light we talked about light from from this laser light um light <coughs> automatically gives <coughs> sight it dispels darkness. All right, so you guys are getting the idea. So maybe let's take, I, I want to hear your ideas about this. What are some other ways we can illustrate this idea that just because grace, uh, just because grace has been appeared to Crete, Crete is automatically going to change. Um, another one I think of is glasses. Uh, the, the presence of glasses over my eyes gives me clearer sight. Does that make sense? So maybe talk about it with your neighbor for a second and see if you can come up with another illustration about this concept that when, when something appears, everything around it changes automatically just because of the presence of that thing. Ready, set, go. <laughs> yeah, right? I don't know what, I don't know what he's asking for. Just, uh, I'm thinking about some illustrations. I'm, I'm looking for some help for illustrations. Danny's like, well, I don't know what you're doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll 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 explain that here in a second. Mm -hmm. And they already apparently have, but they don't know what what, it, what he really is. Right. Right. But when they find I'll give you a little countdown in preparation to share an answer or two. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. I heard some great ideas up here because I'm close. But um, so, what are some ideas that you came up with? The presence of something changes all that's around it. Presence of a conductor. What you're oh yeah, presence of a conductor. So, just help us help us flesh out that illustration so we can see it in our minds. Well, before if you ever go into uh, an orchestra performance, before Father Warmer left. Of just sound, mm -hmm. but when the conductor comes up, everybody straightens up. Yep. Here we go. Here we go. Now it's business time. Yeah, yeah. I, I I haven't been to many symphonies, but the ones I have, I, I was. That's one of my favorite parts is when it's all this raw 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 raw, and all of a sudden the guy comes up and Stop. he stops, and then he he may tune some people up, but that's pretty cool. What else? What's another? What happens when the teacher walks into the classroom? Yes. Not <laughs> yeah, but the idea is it should, right? It used, to be that used to be that way where a teacher walks in. What's another idea? Yes, Lisa. We talked about even the purpose of like the presence of the law to begin with. Until we had the law, it didn't define what sin was or so that was like Yeah, wow. And then of course, being homemakers, we talked about how like Don fish liquid, you know, <laughs> Boom. Yeah, it goes away for sure. Absolutely. That's a good picture right there. Yeah. What's another picture? The picture of the sun. Yes. Because when it comes up, darkness goes away. Yeah. And 
until it comes up and there's daylight, I don't get up and leave here. <laughs> well, uh, right, so right. It changes. It, it gives us light. It gets moving and changes us to light. Right. How many have ever, how many have ever woken up stressed because you stress something all night long and you wake up and the light comes up and some of that stress is gone. Um, I had a mentor say, um, <clears throat> don't fight the giants at night, you know, because they're not as big as you think they are at night. Something, something about when daylight comes. So one of the first things I do is open a window. When I go camping, I used to go camping a lot when, I, when the kids were little. Um, my favorite time was when that sun just went, because it, it changed everything about... At one time it was scary because of the, all the little beady eyes looking through the bushes and now all of a sudden the birds are singing and the, the, t the water is trickling and all that. And so it dispels fear and darkness and, and all that. It's a great, great, and warmth comes in. Yeah. A good cup of coffee. <laughs> oh, spoken like a great, yeah, a cup, good cup of, I mean, I can be sitting there going, <laughs> right? It just changes everything. My daughter has... Uh, she has a shirt that says, um, without my bluey and coffee, my, my day is not started yet. And <laughs> bluey is the thing, but anyway. You said something. Um, I said, when a lady walks in the room, sometimes the conversation changes. Yeah. And then he said, or the preacher. <laughs> oh, my gosh. You wouldn't even know it. I mean, there was one time I was in, uh, in a, so... I don't know how, how much to, I may edit this part out, but um, <laughs> so my, my wife's father was, was a partier person, right? And so we were at his house once and there was a, one of his parties going on and I was at a table and everybody was drinking all around there and there's, they're, they're, they're just, I mean, there's just things going all over the place, jokes and just words and attitudes all over. Then I had to go, they sent me on an errand. So I got up, went to another another part of the house, came back, sat down, very same people, and they're like, you know what my favorite hymn is? My favorite hymn is this, and I was like, who told? <laughs> who told? It just changes everything, yeah, changes everything. A lot of times, uh, I've, I've heard that sometimes, like on an airplane, some pastors won't tell people what they do because it changes the conversation because of that. One more idea, one more illustration. Yeah. Yeah. We had some neighbor neighbor kids, and and uh, they they loved Marshall because Marshall was this giant of a guy, and they loved to play catch with Marshall and. They'd come out and say, Marshall, come out. And they, 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 were, they were not well-behaved kids, but when Marshall came out and played, they, 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 would, they would listen rapidly to whatever he had to say. And so it was really great to, to see. Well, those are great. And I promise if I do uh, put this in some kind of literature manuscript or something, I'll give you guys credit for your illustrations. <laughs> I promise. I probably should have got that from the outset. <clears throat> here's, here's something I want to ask you. Um, so I have here grace defines and grace describes. So grace defines something and grace describes something. Let me just ask this question. What's the difference between these two words? And, and the significance might be surprising about the difference because it's probably a small one, but the impact of it may be bigger than we realize. So what's a, what's a definition? Let's just, let's just think Webster's Dictionary. If we were to look it up, what is a definition? If I were to have you and say, can you define a hymnal? How would you define a hymnal? It's a, it's, it's a book of Christian songs. What's another, what's another definition of a hymnal? All right. So, we, we, so a definition is short. 
and it talks about this, the, 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 the subject, the, qua the, quali the quality of it. Um, so a definition of a hymnal is uh, a book of Christian songs. How do you describe a hymnal? Color, shade. Um, the, the, there are Christian songs in here, but they're usually, they're ordered, they're numbered. Uh, how are they numbered, Jerry? What, what's, what's the strategy behind a hymn? I'm, I'm they're, truly they're, asking they're this now. Yeah, but what? Oh, oh, really? Yeah, they're subject. That's the way that hymnal is placed in there, by subject. <laughs> I was this years old when I learned that. Um, <laughs> so they're, 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 it's not just alphabetized or no. just... So there's a so so you you've helped me describe it. So there's a glossary. Yeah, uh -huh. like a <gasps> topical index of songs. I went to seminary and did not know this. <laughs> Author, composers, translators. You know what? I probably should go back to seminary. Wow. Okay. So so a grace defines what is grace defining in this in this verse. Right. What's that? I'm going to write that down. <laughs> so, so, yeah. Yeah, so, so grace is the... Wow. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, yeah, I'm going to come back to you, and we're going to write that down. And, and uh, where did you where did you hear that? Is that just something you've had all for a long time? Okay. Isn't it great how some things just stay with us for so long? It's so great. So uh, grace is defining some characters of God. Grace is defining some characters of salvation. Um, grace is also describing some things. Uh, and so we have this, this, this impact. Grace is about to land onto Crete and change Crete and make some, make some things so it ought to be so. And so Crete is about to be changed in this heroic fashion. Next thing, grace is our teacher. And I spent so long on this because there's some rich things in this one. Grace is our teacher. Listen, listen to the way Paul describes this. So in verse 12, um, the ESV says training. Your, your version may say something different. What are some other words that your verse has, your version has? What's that? Instructing. Instructing. Yes. What else? Teaches. Anything else? So because of those, di those differing words, I went ahead and looked at some of the, uh, the Greek n nuances of this word, and I was floored because... You hear me out. Um, Paul is describing grace as a taskmaster, a schoolmaster. Discipling, yes, right. So here, training is talking about that 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 grace is our teacher, our discipliner, discipler. And this is what really kind of made me made my ears prick up a little bit is that Paul's defining or Paul's yeah describing grace the same way he describes the law. I just have to stop right there for a second, right? Especially what we're talking about that grace now is our teacher, just like the law was our teacher before we were saved. Grace is now teaching us. What's it teach? What is grace teaching us? What is it? What is it um, discipling us for? Well, here it says to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. These words in Greek are exactly the words that we have in English. God, ungodliness. What are some things we could describe as ungodly? Gossiping, yeah. We so so now that we got the the dam unplugged, what are some other other things we could describe as ungodliness? Gossip, being a gossip, wine. wine. Some things are starting to come back from the list before, right? 
So renouncing ungodliness and worldly passions. What is that talking about? We're talking about some sexual areas here now, some, some of these worldly passions, not just sexual, but also just, just, just uh, lusts of the flesh. What's that? Coveting. coveting. Yeah, okay, we can go coveting, yeah. Does your versions have anything different here than ungodliness and worldly passions? What does yours have? Desires. What's that? Desires, Desires. okay. So, so um, I said this in another class where um, w- when, I was, th- th- when I was unsaved, the, the, the issue that I had was whatever came in my mind as a thought, I, I didn't have anyone or anything telling me to stop thinking that way so that my thought process could carry itself to its fullest extent, which was death, right? So now here, worldly desires, now we have grace teaching us that there, that there, that there's a st- there needs to be a stopping point. Someone needs to be able to say, stop what you're thinking, stop how you're thinking, Stop what you're feeling, right? Um, and, and grace is that, is that thing. So grace teaches us, trains us, disciples us, disciplines us to renounce, say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Remember this chart diagram here from last week? Let's go back here for a second because this is what I was referring to last week. We have two different mindsets here, especially in our current culture. We have person A over here, person B over here. We talked about that this person here is those type of people, we call them the Marthas, the A-type personalities. (laughs) These people here, they want to live life excellent with excellence. They're pursuing excellent things. They're disregarding things that, that are that are what they consider low, uh, low hanging fruit. They're ignoring that. These people here live excellent lives. These people over here, we call them, they're living authentic lives. These people are a little more relaxed, right? These people here are saying, you know what, if you don't get to the goal that you have set for you, that's okay. You're 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 fine. Just just let's try again some other time. These here living authentically. I'm not afraid of showing you my hard things or my junk. These people here says, I'm not really excited about showing you stuff, some of that stuff because I'm living for something more. The problem with these two extremes here is that when left unhindered or unrebuked, unencouraged, what will happen is that it goes to its fullest. Over here, living excellently can easily turn into legalism, can it not? To where someone's saying, uh, I'm doing these things so that I can gain God's favor. No longer is it about um, living excellently, it's just legalism. Over here, to its fullest, goes to, the only word I can come up with, I don't really like it just because it's so, I don't know, got so many connotations to it, but decadence. Um, living authentically, li- living just, you know, you don't, it's okay if you don't make it all the way, just, just, you know, you know just be okay with yourself. Um, this can lead easily to decadence. And I asked last week, what is the thing that, that corrects this? And it's grace. Here's how it works. Grace is the bridge. So grace here as a teacher, grace compels Holiness. If you want to write that down somewhere, grace compels holiness. And this takes us back to that, that beginning illustration with the little spacecraft with the laser light. Grace in and of itself, correctly perceived, should propel us towards holiness. And it does so by being a teacher. Here on this side, it teaches us to renounce these things. Whoa, it wanted to zoom in. Um, it t- grace teaches to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions. It's compelling us towards holiness. So grace is pulling us back towards this way and away from decadence. We say it this way sometimes. We say, and Paul even says it later on in this passage, that grace um, says, because, because Christ died for your sins, you don't want to keep on sinning. Why do you want to keep on sinning? If, if, and... and and in some pictures would say, pushing Christ's salvation through the muck again, right? Um, so grace teaches us this concept. 
But then Paul says that grace is also our power. So grace is our teacher, and now grace is our power. It's this right here. And to live, if we want to circle that word, to live, that's what we're going to focus on. And to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. Let's focus on this word to live for a second. Um, we've talked about this before, and it's, it's, a, it's one of our components here at Colonial Hills. Um, we here look at the idea of, of uh, the makeup of man as a tripartite view, if you want to think about it that way, that there's three parts to mankind. Now, other people, other theologians think differently about some of this stuff, but here it kind of makes sense because we have a triune God, why, and so we should, we would have a tr- our image of God would be triune in, in and of itself. And Scripture, especially in Greek, has three different words for life. So life number one is called bios, life. And we get our word, what? Biology, right? So it's, it's, it's living stuff. A tree has bios life. My, my skin and my carrot has bios life. I don't have a carrot. I don't know why I said it like that. <coughs> so bios life. So this is things that are alive. So I call this alive life. And then scripture also uses a phrase for life called suke, which is soul life. Uh, Paul talks about this in some other areas where this is like, um, we would say, our emotional be- our center right here. So this is our mind, our emotions. They sit right here in the suke life. But then there's this third description of life called zoe life. And this is God life. This is spirit life. So a tree does not have, it has bios life, but it doesn't have suke life. And it definitely doesn't have Zoe life. Your dog, my dog, who I love sometimes, um, has bios life. And I can, I, there's some things he does, I'm like, you know what you're doing. Uh, and you're doing it on purpose. So I want to say maybe there's an emotional state. My dog definitely has emotions. You probably can see emotions in your dog, right? By his tail, By his tail yes. When his tail's tucked between his legs, he knows I'm mad at him. Um, he's a sweet dog. When he is. But then there's Zoe, then there's Zoe life. And this is the life that interacts with God. This is the God, this is the life that God gives. This is God life right here. And in this verse is Zoe life. And to live. So here God, here Paul is saying to Titus that grace teaches that now we have a Zoe life that empowers us to do these things. So that's why we talk about that grace is also our power. What does that mean? How does that relate? We go back to this diagram here. Grace compels holiness for someone over here who thinks he can do it himself or they can do it themselves or need to do it themselves to the same message of grace saying, you don't have to do it yourself because Christ through grace has already done it for you. So here, the same words almost. Grace now compels holiness for this person by empowering them to live in a correct way through the correct power. A self-controlled life, an upright life, a godly life. Not on his own power, but whose power? Christ's power, right? So here, I want you to think of a rubber band even sometimes. And maybe you can come up with some other illustrations of what this looks like. Grace pulls these two um, extremes, I guess you could say, and pulls them and saves them and rescues them from falling off the cliff of decadence and legalism. Grace pulls them back into a right life, which is what Titus wants to do for the churches, to correct (coughs) um, the way that they're thinking here, with whatever, do whatever you want to do, it's fine. To here, you have to do the right things in order to be loved. Grace fixes both of those problems. And because of that, we have, well, here's, this, here's that slide I have about uh, what happens is, is that legalism and decadence are leading, leading us to death, and grace saves us from that. It's grace that does that by teaching us, by being our teacher, that we, will, we can renounce and we can live by another power. 
Isn't that cool? I mean, there's some powerful things in this, in this passage here. Um, because ultimately here, Christ is our freedom. And this is that person I put on the, on the bridge um, before, last, was last week. Because of our freedom, now we have this ability to live authentically excellent lives. Because we, now we know what we need to be doing. We, now we know the goals and, 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 and the things that need to be done. But we also know what we can't do it ourselves. Only God can do it through us. So we live authentically excellent lives because God's doing it for us. We know what to do. He teaches us what to do. And He gives us the power to do that. Grace is our freedom. So here's that word of freedom. Waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, <clears throat> um, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are what? Zealous for good works. Um, so what we have here is Paul describes the standards. Here are the standards. Renounced ungodliness, renounced worldly passions, self-controlled life, an upright life, a godly life. But then in this, ver in this passage, he says, these, these standards are not the reason why God loves us. These are standards God, God gives, but not the, they're, they're, not the standards that, they're not the standards of the reason why God loves us. Because otherwise, we're fighting for his love and we're straining under the weight that we think we must try for all these things. Now here's, I've been waiting I, I talked to Jerry about this. I said, Jerry, does this sound okay? <laughs> so I'm just going to let you read this for a second. Salvation is work-based, but it's not on our works, <laughs> right? Christ does all the work. Christ does all the work. Christ does the one that's reaching out. Um, Christ is the one that, that, um, that, that woos our hearts. A lot of times um, we, uh, I, again, talk about youth world, when teenagers say that they've, they've uh, come to accept Christ. Now, we all know what that means. But the part of me goes, did you really, though? <laughs> because I bet you, if you think about it, God came to you first and wooed you first. And I bet you that if we look in your life, there are probably some things in your life we could see that God is working in your life months before this moment happened. Jerry, yes. When I see that, it does bother me a little bit. Uh-huh. <laughs> right. Okay, I'm glad you brought that up because I, I, put this up, I put this up here. I asked you, I asked a bunch of people. So um, I'm going to move this on over this way. Okay. No, I'm just kidding. Because the idea is, is sound. So salvation is love-based. So you're replacing love with works. Here's, here's the way that this, this, this um, brings out. I had a professor in college, and he said, um, when a person realizes that they're not breaking God's laws, they're breaking God's love that changes everything for a person, that ought to change something, that propels them to holiness to say, I'm not breaking God's, the, the laws that God gives us, the directions that God gives us, these, these things here, these standards that God gives us, they're, they're, not, they're not law things, they're not things, oh, I, I was ungodly, so now God hates me. No. We say um, we're breaking God's love for us. We're taking ourselves out of His, His, His grasp, if we can say it that way. Not not salvation-wise, but we're no longer putting ourselves under the umbrella of His protection, His love. We're not experiencing His fullness. Um, I, I like to say it this way: um, Imagine if the day after I got married, I said, "Shannon, I love you." I'm so excited we're married. I'm moving to North Dakota, um, and we're just going to be married. I'll be in North Dakota. You can stay here in Texas. Will I be married? No. Yes. Am I experiencing marriage? No. no. Am I experiencing the relationship with my wife? No. no. So uh, a lot of times this idea here that you're talking about, Mary, is, th is that breaking God's love. Where did I put it? There it is right there. Break, it's not, it's Salvation, God did all the work, but the work was from love, right? The work was from love. Immense love. Cosmic-sized love. Love that takes a little craft all the way to Alpha Centauri kind of love. The craft didn't do anything of its own. These lasers did. 
We don't do anything on our own. God did. And that's our declaration. Paul says, Titus, declare these things. Make it be your stage. Make it be your curtain call. Not curtain call. Make it be your, your prime message on the stage to these people. Declare these things. Exhort, which is to encourage. And rebuke, which means say to stop. With all authority. Don't stop. When someone gets mad at you, don't stop. When someone tries to encourage you, don't relax. Keep on going. Rebuke with all authority. Say, I understand, but this is from God, not from me, not from Paul. This is from God. Encourage. God loves you. No, he doesn't. This is from God, Oliver. Listen to me, right? I'll just use you for example because you're right there. Yeah. With all authority. Then I love this part. Let no one disregard you. Don't, don't let anyone discourage you. Don't let anyone try to um, dissuade you. Don't let anyone point you in a, wrong, in a wrong direction. There's a lot of people that will come up. One of the things I love when you first come to a, a new church or a new environment, someone will come up to you and say, see that person over there? Watch out for that person. And I'd be like, duly noted, I'm watching out for you. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, let no one disregard you. Let no one try to point you in a wrong way. No, let, let no one try to, um, to move you anywhere beyond declaring these things. God's grace has descended upon Crete, and it's about to change Crete forever. We will be the stage to proclaim God's grace. And that's how we end it here with this. We go into chapter 3. What's that? I can't wait to read 3. Right? <laughs> Um, because that's what we are. The church is a stage for God's grace to be proclaimed, but honestly, truly, we are the stage that proclaims God's grace through everything that we do. Um, if I ever to write a book, I have a couple books in my mind. One of them, the title would be, Let Your Profession Be Your Profession. It's this idea here. Everything you do professes God's love and what He's done for you, His grace for you, and that it's about to change your entire life. Mm-hmm.